Am I on? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. Let's try this again. See what happens. Glory to God. Are we on? All right, praise the Lord, everybody. I had a little technical issue. Got blocked for playing music on Facebook tonight. It don't make no sense because people play music all the time and they, they don't block them. People put all kind of crazy for, for provocative stuff on Facebook and don't get blocked. But we as God's children do something right and they want to block us. That don't make any sense to me. But you know the devil's a lie because he can't stop what God is doing. In his word, when God, you know, has something to speak, it's going to come forth one way or another. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. And I pray that you are blessed by the word tonight, that God encourages and enriches your soul to keep standing on the word of truth. Amen. So let's get ready to dive into our lesson tonight. So let's open a word of prayer. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word tonight. I pray that you, Father, would enrich us, encourage, edify, build us up on our faith, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, forgive us for our sins, knowing unknowing, Father God, and, and change our hearts for the better. And we thank you, O oh God, that you speak to us by divine revelation, a word that will help, Father God, transform, a word that will empower, a word that will encourage, that you will be exalted and magnified. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Let me set this other thing up just one second. Amen. Okay. So, let, so last, last week we left off talking about renouncing the occult spirit. All right? We talked about that the word occult means hidden or secret or mysterious things pertaining to the supernatural, right? So the enemy, what he does, because occult is another word that, that means to prevent things being revealed to you, but he wants you to have an insight to receive something from the demonic world that's not of God. We have to be careful as children of God not to allow ourselves to be entangled or enticed by the mighty forces. Many times the enemy comes into our lives to distract and deter you from the truth of God's word. But when you got the truth of God in you, the word of God empowers, the word of God changes, the word ignites. And you have to allow the spirit of God to really flood your heart with the truth of God's word to help empower you to keep standing in the faith of Jesus Christ. Many times we, we find ourselves distracted. We're not paying attention to the attacks of the enemy when he comes against us. So we got to stand on the word of truth, knowing that only way we can overcome, we must bind the demonic cult spirit. We got to bind that spirit. We got to denounce the controlling spirits of the enemy that come to our lives to put us in a spiritual place of lockdown. So many believers are in a place of exile, and, and God wants you to know tonight that you don't have to be in that place. You can be free from the tactics of the enemy as you recognize what that spirit is that has come to imprison you because the things that are hidden from you is the revelation for God's word, and God wants the word to be revealed to us, not concealed from us. In the scripture, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, 29th chapter, verse 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the works of his law, of this law. And one thing about God's word, 
If you go up a little further in the same passage of scripture, it starts at verse 25. So then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God their father, of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not, whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring it upon, upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. Then it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. God has a plan, he has a purpose, he has a will for every believer that we must walk in his truth every day of our lives and not allow ourselves to be deceived and manipulated by the enemy. We talked about that last week. I was trying to think of the word superstitious. How so many people are superstitious. They indulge in the supernatural. Let's look at something here. I, I was reading something here. Give me one second. I don't think I'll pull it up on the screen. I think I could actually. Let's see here. Give me one second. I'm going to pull this up on the screen to see what I'm reading. Amen. This is really, it's really good. Really a good word tonight. And I uh, pray that this blesses you. Ooh, that's not good. It's not clear. Okay, there you go. All right, I'm going to put this up on the screen, so I'll let you see what I'm reading here. It's, last week we talked about the dictionary defines a cult as a hidden, secret, mysterious, particularly pertaining to the supernatural. Examples of occult practices are astrology, witchcraft, and Wicca. The blacks of arts, fortune telling, magic, both black and white, Ouija boards, tarot cards, spiritualism, paraphrasiology, Satanism. Human beings are always been interested in the occult from ancient times to this day. Occult practices and psychic Hello? phenomena. Hello? Hey, you not need a ride tomorrow, Charles? Ho I'm going to call you back. Yeah. Call you back? Okay, so cultism is what it's talked about. Practices, psychic phenomena, and have captivated millions of people worldwide. And this is not limited to the ignorance or uneducated. There are several factors that make the cult fascinating to everyone, even in our age of technology and scientific advances. So this is what happens when a lot of people don't know the word of God. They indulge in sinful practices of indulging in the supernatural, in the area that's beyond the natural realm of the flesh, into a place of darkness. And they find themselves get, having a spell placed on themselves because of the thing they allow to be done by the enemy. So we have to be careful what we allow ourselves to be entangled in with the enemy when he comes into our lives because... The enemy knows exactly what to do and how to manipulate and control you. So you got to get into the word of God for yourself. So you find this on God questions. And the name of this subject is, um, what is their cult? What is their cult spirit? What is their cult? So that's the name of this, this, uh, program. So you got to get into the place of the word. And then I was looking at something else tonight and it says, um, what is Wicca? And this this is fascinating too. This is another fascinating subject. Because this is what is Wicca? 
is Wicca witchcraft. Okay? So I'm going to read this. I'm going to show you something here. This is really good. Y'all can follow along with this. It says, Wicca is a neo-pagan religion that has been growing in popularity except in the United States and Europe. There are many websites and books claiming to teach real Wicca, but the truth is, is that there is no consensus among Wiccans as to what religion is all about. The reason for this, this is reason for this is that Wicca, as it is practiced now, is only about 50 years old. Wicca is a belief system that Britain General Garner cobbled together in 1940s and 1950s and from a variety of religious traditions and beliefs as well as Freemason rituals. You hear that? The Freemasons. They're part of the same to, uh, uh, demonic force. Since Gardner published several books about espousing this system of worship, many offshoots and variations of Wicca have sprung up. Some Wiccans are polytheistic, that means many gods, worship more than one deity, while others worship um, only the god or the goddess. Still, other Wiccans worship, super, worship nature and call uh, the Gaia. After Greeks, earth goddess, some Wiccans pick and choose of Christian doctrine to embrace while others totally reject Christianity. Most practitioners of Wicca believe in reincarnation. Ain't that something? They believe in reincarnation. So most Wiccans will vehemently deny that Satan is part of their pathogen, pantheon, citing major doctrinal difference between themselves and Satanists. Wiccans generally promote moral relativity, disdaining labels like good and evil, right and wrong. Wicca, Wiccas has one law rule called the reed. Do what you will harm ye none. At first blush, the reed seems like complete and uninhabited personal license. You can do whatever you want as long as no one gets hurt. However, Wiccans are quick to point out that the ripple effect of the one action that carried the further uh, further reaching consequences. They are art articulate this particularly in the threefold law, which says all good that a person does to another returns threefold in his life and harm is also returned threefold. Ain't that something? Because that's how the enemy deceives people. And they conjure up their own religion. That's what we talked about, renouncing the spirit of religion. Because many people find themselves in, engaged in such a practice and their minds become manipulated by the enemy when it says here, all good that a person does returns to him threefold in his life and harm is also returned. So they're comparing the good as well as the bad coming back to you threefold. Whatever you dish out is what's going to come back to you. So we have to really be prayed up when it comes to the word of God and let the word of God minister to your heart. It says one factor, one of the major factors that contributes to the body fascination with Wicca is, is purported use of spells and magic, a deliberate misspelling intended a separate Wiccan from magicians and illusionists. Curiosity as well as the spiritual uh, neo, neophytes are most eager to delve into these mysteries. Not all Wiccans practice witchcraft, but those that do claim magic is to them what prayer is to Christians. Ain't that something? How deceptive the enemy is with his own trickery and his own, own doctrine and religious systems is to control the minds of people to make them think that witchcraft is okay. So we have to know the word of God for ourselves. It's very important as a child of God. Listen to me tonight. It's very important as a child of God to get the word of God in your spirit. Because if you don't get the word of God in your spirit, you are easily manipulated by the enemy and you will follow after evil practices. That is an abomination to God. Read Deuteronomy chapter 29. Read the whole chapter when you get a chance. Because that's what happened when God told the children of Israel. They started indulging in, in, in um, idolatry, the thing that God 
I test, grotesque the most was them giving to other gods. That's why he, when he gave the Ten Commandments, said, thou shalt shall have no other god before me. Because they found themselves mingling with other nations and practicing their customs. Isn't that a shame? We do the same thing today. We, we get around people. We go to, to those fortune tellers. We go to tarot card readers. We go looking for a revelation. A cult spirit, it keeps you from receiving the truth of God's word. That's the reason why it's called an occult, because it prevents something from being revealed to you. But what it wants you to be revealed to you is the things from the divine forces. And we have to pay attention to the spirit of God. When God begins to speak to us, we got to let the Lord move by his spirit into our hearts to give us a revelation concerning his word. It's the word that transforms. It's the word that liberates. It's the word that breaks the power of the enemy off our lives. So we got to get in the word. Amen? Because I tell you, if you don't get in the word, you're vulnerable. One thing we talked about last week, <coughs> excuse me. So in such instances, demons attacking the body was determined to remain hidden. We talked about that. That's one of the points. We talk about renouncing demonic forces. So when we are dealing with the root issues that affect our destinies, this is the same spirit at work. We must bind the occult spirit and pray. Hear this? We must bind this occult spirit and pray for exposure so that we're not locked down and are free, so we can be free to experience all that God has for us. You cannot experience all God has for you if you are being deceived by the enemy and stuck in a dark place in a spiritual lockdown where you're not allowing the truth of God's word to come into you, but you're rejecting God's word, opposing God's word, so the enemy fights against you so hard, tooth and nail, to keep you blinded from the truth. We talk about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Read that whole chapter when you get a chance, because it talks about Paul says that, that, about the gospel. The gospel has been hidden from those who are lost by the enemy. You have a lot of people sit in church week after tree, after week, excuse me, week after week, and they're still blinded from the truth. But they faithfully come to church, haven't heard nothing, nothing got in their spirit, not interested in changing. They just go on to church, say, I went to church. So we got to get to the place where we pay attention to demonic forces when they're at work in our bodies, in our minds, in our children, in our spouses, and in everything we do because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he starts his attack right there between your eyes, the mindset. If he can prevent you from seeing yourself the way God sees you, from receiving the truth of God's word in your spirit, he can put a dark cloud between you and God to keep you from seeing what God wants you to see. I, I remember one day while, while I was living in Texas and I was driving, going to work, and the fog was so thick, you couldn't even see the car in front of you. And you had to turn on your fog lights and turn off the bright lights so that the fog lights can at least project some type of light that can go through the darkness. We have the light of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And there's a dark cloud the enemy uses against every believer to distract you and deter you from the truth of God's word to keep you from seeing what's before you. Every blessing, every promise God has for you is right before your eyes. When you open up God's word and you begin to study God's word, meditate on God's word, get the word in you. The word gives you revelation of the things that God has unfolded for you. And the enemy does what he, what he does to keep you distracted by chaos and confusion in your life. He calls the children act up. When your kids go to jail for doing something foolish, the husband acting up, the wife acting up, to keep nothing but chaos in your house. And nobody takes the time out to pray. So we get into an argumental state. 
we become very aggressive, become mean and obnoxious, and we're saying every foul word that comes to mind against one another. And we hurt one another with our tongues and we're not quick to repent. So we go to bed angry at the other person and we don't let go of the animosity. And I've known people go days at a time, weeks at a time, mad at somebody and refuse to let go. That's witchcraft. That's a spirit of witchcraft that got you in a dark place of deception <coughs> to make you think that I got to hold on to unforgiveness. And the word tells us, Jesus taught his disciples over and over about love and forgiveness. Because in order to inherit the kingdom of God, there needs to be repentance in your heart. There needs to be love in your heart towards one another. Even when you're angry, you've got to be quick to reconcile. But we find ourselves stuck in a dark place in our mindset of hatred and bitterness because of witchcraft. The enemy knows if I can manipulate your mindset to make you think this is the normal, normal behavior, the normal life to live, I can keep you distracted from the truth. My God, my God. So tonight we're going to talk about heading off demons at the path. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining in. So we're going to talk about heading off demons at the past. I remember the story of the tortoise and the hare. And they were getting ready to go into a race. And the tortoise was so cocky and so confident in his speed and in himself that he never thought the tortoise could beat him. I mean, the, the, the hare could beat him, which is the turtle. So the, the, the tortoise, I'm mean, not the tortoise, it was the hare. The hare was like the one, the rabbit. He was fast. So the rabbit was so cocky and confident in himself. So when they started the race, he sat on the sideline, watched the turtle go past real slow. Because, you know, turtles don't move fast. They're slow. They're slow in the progression. And as he was progressing slowly, the rabbit would run past him. Then he'd sit down a little bit more, playing games on the side of the road and everything. The turtle got so close to the finish line to the hare thought I can go and manipulate and run and cut him off at the pass and still lost because he stumbled over an obstacle and did not make it over to the finish line and the turtle won the race because the word says the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong but to the one that endures to the end the, the turtle endured to the end and won the race. The rabbit was so quick and confident in himself, he thought can no one beat him. The enemy is the same way in our lives. We can become like the turtle, patient, gentle, meek, forbearing, loving, and we stand fast in the faith of Jesus Christ. And the enemy feels like, I got you. He feels like, I got you. I can stop you from moving forward. And we got to get to a place in ourselves where we know that I have the greater one backing me up. I got the greatest one inside of me pushing me into my destiny and my purpose. And the enemy cannot stop me unless I take my eyes off the prize. You know what our prize is? Jesus Christ. If we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ, then we find ourselves like the hare sitting on the side of the road thinking I got time. I can do whatever I want to do and I'll get to the finish line before anyone else does. And before you know it, you done stumble through life, through the obstacles the enemy put in your pathway to stop you. Instead of heading him off at the pass, you let him get ahead of you. And guess what he does to get ahead of you? 
He leads you. He guides you. He directs you in the pathway of destruction. So we have to wake up and pay attention. Not allow ourselves to be distracted by our own ego, our prideful hearts. But allow the Holy Spirit to bring patience and endurance and long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, self-control, goodness, faithfulness in our hearts every day that our mouths would line up with the word of God to speak what God says to speak and not allow ourselves to speak ourselves out of our promise. I made a statement a few weeks ago that many people miss the blessings of God because they allow themselves to be distracted. The blessing's still there, but you can't attain it because you're blinded from the truth. But when you allow the Holy Spirit to redirect your mindset back into the pathway, the plan, the purpose God has for you, then you can see the blessings that God has for you and be a blessing so God can use you to help change somebody else's life. Amen. Let's get into our book. It says, as you read this book, occult spirits will probably cause confusion and attempt to convince you to stop reading. You know what happened to me when I started reading this book? few years ago I started reading this book and I started reading things that was convicting so I stopped reading the book because I didn't want to be convicted I was indulging in sin and a sinful life and didn't want to change at that moment but because I say this all the time because I've been in ministry for so many years the more I try to shut God out the more he comes in and I picked the book back up and read it to the end. And I found out it was one of the greatest access to apply to my life. Because it taught me not just the battlefield of the mind, that book, but this book made me aware of the demonic forces that attack the mindset. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to redirect your mindset, to purge your mindset from the witchcraft spirit, you're going to be stuck in a dark place and can't rise above it because your strength is being sucked out of you. That means your life is depreciating. And the enemy knows if I can stop you by controlling your thought life to put so much negativity in you, I can prevent you irrigate from listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because he knows when you hear the Holy Spirit can convict you of sin to change. If he can prevent you from hearing, he can block you from being obedient to the word of God. You may have to stop periodically and lay your hands upon your head and declare, hear this? Declare that you have the mind of Christ. You have the power to stop the enemy at the pass. Even when you start doing things that God has called you to do and you get discouraged, you need to look yourself in the mirror Lay your hands on your own head and say that I am a child of God. I have the mind of Christ. I am ambassador of the kingdom of God. I represent God in this life. You have to tell yourself, I'm someone of value, someone important in the eyes of God, and God is holding me accountable. When you speak to yourself and you start believing what you're saying to yourself, 
you're going to start walking in it. I remember when I was 16 years old, and my father made me a junior deacon in the church. Had no idea what a deacon was, but I seen deacons, how they operated in church. I had a vision at the age of 14 of being a minister. And as I was learning at 16 to develop a prayer life, I still dealt with the demonic forces that were controlling my flesh. Even though I had desire, y'all listen to me, to obey God and follow God, my flesh didn't want to let go of the sin I was doing. So I struggled from 16, 17, 18, 19. God brought the same vision back to me about being a minister. And I went to a lady in my dad's church and I began to share with her what's on my heart in the vision. And I broke down and started crying. And I said, I had this vision and I don't understand what, what God is saying to me. And I explained it to her. And I said, I heard the voice say, don't let my people perish. And I saw Jesus sitting on the throne. He was so big, clothed in white. And he had his hands on his face and his head down because the glory was so bright. And he shielded me from seeing his glory. And he spoke out of the glory and said, don't let my people perish. When I explained to her what I saw and said what I said, she said, you called to be a minister. You need to stop running from it and go tell your dad you accept the ministry. I was so excited from that moment. I ran to tell my father. I said, Dad, God has called me to the ministry. I was 19 years old. August 19, 1985. I accept the call of the ministry. But I'm going to tell you this. Just because I accept the call to ministry didn't mean things changed right away. I still struggle with the same habits, the same issues, the same problems. So now I'm a minister of God trying to live a minister's life and straddle the fence. So my father sent me to Bible college I was rebellious, went to school for two semesters, dropped out of school, decided to live a righteous life. Sinful, hypocritical, singing in the choir, preaching in church, still living a sinful life with no conviction. The only way my life began to change is when God had to strip me of myself and caused me to lose everything I had, my place to live at, my job I lost at, had nowhere else to turn but back to my father. This is a revelation here. I turned back to my father, and I told him what happened. My father sent me to get a, sent for a ride to come get me, bring me back home. Came back home, still sinful. Even though now I'm being convicted because something's happening on the inside. My father kicked me out of the house at 19 because I was so sinful and rebellious. But I tell you, I was 21 actually. 21, I got kicked out of the house. And when I left the house, I really went wild, buck wild, living a sinful life, being controlled by demonic forces. My life did not begin to change until I got older and got into a church in 1992, April, a non-denominational church where the pastor led me to salvation. He said, you've been born again. You said you accept Christ at an early age. I was nine years old. I gave my life to Christ. But he said, you never understood it. So I'm going to lead you to Christ. I was married, and I got baptized. That's when things started to change slowly and progressively. Still living a sinful life, even married. But God never turned his back on me until I finally lost everything again, lost my wife, lost the children, and the Holy Spirit said, now turn to the Lord. When I turned to the Lord, my wife came back, children came back. Then my life 
began to progress and go up to the way God wanted to be. I started walking in ministry, started living in ministry, started doing what God come to do. Not saying I didn't struggle, still struggle, same habits, same addictions, but the influence of the habits and addictions became lesser and lesser of more power in my life. Because now I'm learning to hear. Because I turn to the Father. When you turn to the Father and your ears become open to hear, the Father speaks and gives you direction. Say, my son, heed the instruction of your Father. and Don't let it depart from you. Wisdom. The wisdom of God came alive in my heart. Then my life began to change. I would not be who I am today if I never had a heart to turn to the Father. I pray this best to somebody tonight because you got to have a heart to turn to the Father and tell the Father, I'm sorry, I messed up, I made a mistake, forgive me for my sins, come and be my Lord and Savior. God does it in an instance. But the problem comes in, the enemy cuts you off at the past when he knows you're at the verge of repenting. He calls other stuff to get in the way of repentance. But you got to have the power of God inside of you to rise above the tax of the enemy in your mind and begin to speak what God says in his word about you. As Joshua 1.8 says, don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth but keep it in your heart and don't let, let, let it come from out of you. So you got to meditate in the word of God day and night. You got to keep yourself in the midst of the word and allow the word of God to be instilled in your heart and the word will bring change in you. You got to keep the word in your heart, in your mouth. The word will cause you to have success and prosper in everything you do. Joshua 1 and 8. Let's go on a little further. These forces need to be exposed. You need to recognize what spirit have you been entertaining? Has it been a lustful spirit? Has it been a prideful spirit? Has it been a rebellious, stubborn spirit? Has it been homosexuality? Has it been uh, a lesbianism? Has it been idolatry? It doesn't matter what it is. You got to recognize what force is using you and denounce that spirit. Renounce the control of it in order to head off such demonic powers at the past. Let's first recognize any areas in our lives where Satan has attacked bind him and his demonic forces from operating further and plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. That'll preach right there by itself. Because once you begin to recognize what that spirit is, what that force that has been controlling you, bind it in the name of Jesus. And if demonic forces his imps. See, one thing about, about the enemy, he don't come all by himself to attack you. He got imps, baby demons, that comes to attack you to destroy you. We can't even defeat an imp in our lives. So when I get a migraine headache, I give power to it because I keep confessing it. I keep agreeing with it. That's an imp. Not saying that your body's not being attacked, but I have to recognize what caused this migraine hit. It's something I ate, something I've done, somebody I've been around. Take medication to counterattack it. But not only take medication, but pray that God will subside the nerves in your brain cells to bring peace to cause the migraine to go away. Like my body. My body been hurting for a while for the last few days. My lower back. I confess it hurts. But yet I tell myself in another voice, I'm still healed in Jesus' name. 
And I recognize that this is a spiritual attack sometimes. It's not always physical that attacks you. I read this earlier, how Satan will, will begin to attack your body through spiritual forces. Who have you been around? What have you done that you shouldn't have done? What is it that's attacking you or attached itself to your body? Because some illnesses are spiritual. And you got to recognize when it's physical and when it's spiritual. And you know the difference because the Holy Spirit will tell you. Place a check besides every area Satan has attacked in your life. They're going to they're gonna name a, a few things in here in just a minute. So we got to recognize, sometimes you got to sit out and write down different things that have been attacking you. And as you begin to read it, recognize that this is a spirit. This, this is the enemy that's been attacking me. Something going on in my body. I can't understand what it is. So I need to take a note right now to find out what is it that's really bothering me. And that, now look at this. So you would name these as you repeat the prayer of deliverance at the end of the chapter. Listen to this. Fear and doubt. You want to write this down, you can write this down. There's a list of things that could be bothering you. There's a force that comes against you. Fear and doubt. Religious mindsets. Stubbornness. Fatigue. That's tiredness. Lies and deceit. Family death. Premature death. Loss of passion for God. These are the, the areas of our lives we've been discussing the last few months. And these are the very tools the enemy uses against you as a believer. Because I can put fear in your heart to stop you from trusting God, you would doubt God's word. If I can set up a religious system in your mindset where you have to reason and justify your wrongdoings and you keep doing things religiously, that means repent repetitively. Keep doing the same old thing that's not good for yourself. Just like a person overindulging eating and you know it's going to make you sick. And you keep doing it anyway. An anorexic is a person who feels that they they can't they eat too much, so they gotta keep spitting up what they eat. Cause they don't want to gain no weight. Religious mindset. Religious mindset could be a, a list of rules and regulations in the church that defies God's word. But because you've been doing it for over 20 years, 30 years, to you it's gospel. It's the way God has structured you according to your mindset. Which is stubbornness. Because when God tries to introduce change, we fight against change. Especially when we're comfortable, I've said this before, with familiar spirits. If we're comfortable being around a certain group of people who we know who are against Christ, enemy keeps you in a place of rebellion where you would not change your circle. You would not change what you do, the life you live, the habits you have, and you get comfortable in it. So you get in your comfort zone. Fatigue is tired. And many times we do so much ministry, we get fatigued. And the reason why sometimes God is trying to refresh you, but you keep doing things God tell you, tell you not to do. There's a time and a season for everything in ministry. And there's a time to rest. But a lot of times we don't want to rest because I feel like I got to do this, I got to do that. God, will we do this? God, will we do that? God, will we go help these people over here? God, will we go to this church over here? God, will we speak over here? God, will we speak over there? So I do all this stuff. The phylacteries of my flesh because I want to please God the way I know to please God. 
But God says, just rest. You're tired. You need to recuperate. You need to be recharged. But I don't hear that part of the voice of God speaking. Because I done shut that part out. Because I done got so busy doing so much stuff. I don't even hear God no more. Ooh, that's sad. That's really sad. So lies and deceit set in. So I lie to myself that I got to keep busy to keep from having an idle mind. It's nothing wrong with resting. We get deceived when we know God is leading to a certain thing and you don't do it. If God says you ought to do a ministry, he equips you, he qualifies you, he gives you a season when you need to do it and a season when you need to sit down. But we have to learn how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in every area of our life and do what God says to do. Amen? Family death and premature death. When these things impact our lives, the many children of God have death after death after death and their families to become bitter and their hearts become callous and God can't speak to them. Death is no way around it. It's something that's going to happen to all of us at one point in our time in our lives. We have to recognize that there are many people who died prematurely from fulfilling their dreams and purpose God has given them because they wouldn't be obedient. They were so stubborn and negative. They talked themselves out of the will of God. We have to be careful. Even when death, because it's inevitable, you can't get around it. When it comes into your family, learn how to have a sympathetic heart and compassion for the loved ones. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Just because death impacted our family, we still can maintain control in God's presence. Let the love of God keep flowing through our hearts to remind us how much God gave his son to die for us that we might live. And live your life as if it's the last time you live on earth for the kingdom of God. Don't lose your passion. Don't lose your desire, your ambition, your drive, that fire. Don't allow the enemy to manipulate and control and deceive you to lose your passion. Because so many times we get church hurt. And our attitude becomes so negative. We shut out the voice of God and lose our passion. For example, a person who loves to sing. Because I've been hurt in the church, I won't sing no more. I might be a musician playing in the church, but because I've been hurt, I don't want to play no more. I might be an usher in the church or a deacon in the church, but because I've been hurt, I don't want to serve no more. That's witchcraft. And a lot of times we don't realize it. That's a strategy from the enemy to deceive you from walking in your divine calling. There are certain people who have been set in churches in certain positions because God put the desire in their hearts to serve in those positions. And they have a strong passion for their area of ministry. Until someone come along and hurt their feelings, then you start losing your passion, losing your zeal. And that should not be, should not be anybody in Christ. We have to have a heart to serve God whether I'm hurt or not hurt. Because Jesus took the worst punishment upon himself so we would not to endure. We got to always remind ourselves of the word. That's one thing God showed me. I've been church hurt many times. I left churches only when God told me it's time to leave. Even when hurt, I maintain a righteous stand to do what I love the most in ministry. 
and the calling God placed in my life to serve God. Because you have to remember the calling on your life is not about the people. About being obedient to the calling that God has placed on your life to serve the people. And when you have a passion for God, I don't care who comes against you, when you have a passion for God, you're not going to manipulate, deceive, trick me, stop me. You ain't going to get in my way to keep me from doing what God come and do. I'm going to keep on doing it. If I have to step over you, I'm going to keep on doing it. Because I know that I've been called by God. You have apostles, and pastors, teachers, evangelists. You have different people in the body of Christ been ordained by God to do certain things in the church. Don't let people stop from doing what God called you to do. If you know you love God and God loves you and God called you to do a certain thing in the work of the kingdom, I don't know why I'm holding, standing on this, but God says don't quit. Don't quit. Somebody need to hear this tonight. Don't quit. You keep serving God. Let God deal with your haters. Let God deal with your enemies. Because the words that bless those who persecute you, pray for them. Because they're so persecuted the prophets who went before you. You have to love one another as Christ loved the church and the spirit of God will continue to elevate you above your haters. That's one thing about ministry. When it comes to ministry in my life, I don't care who likes me and don't like me. I don't care. I still do what God called me to do. People might get up and walk out when I get to preach. I don't care. If I got two or three people in there, I still don't care. I still do what God come and do. I started out in ministry with my, just my wife and, and three children. When I first started ministry. And I did not let the enemy get me discouraged. I started church in 2005 and left for a whole year. And God allowed the church to join it down to two people. Because there still was something in my heart he had to deal with. So I ended up dissolving the ministry in 2006 of August. But I learned something. Because I learned how to structure a church, how to get a church started without any help. Because I did research by listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And God taught me what I needed to do to start a church. So you guys are calling your life tonight. Whatever that calling is, if you don't know how to do it, go on Google. There's a lot of info on Google for different types of ministry, different types of callings. Do some research. Study. Study show yourself approved in God. He worked with me. I saw somebody put that in earlier. Study that word. The word will teach you how to do your ministry. But the problem comes that we don't want to study. I want to hear a good, good, feel good message, but I don't want to study the word for myself. Witchcraft. That's the enemy. Jezebel, a controlling spirit. We've been talking about for the last couple of months. Jezebel, Athaliah, Delilah, these three spirits who are so strong banded together to control and manipulate your mindset. To destroy your purpose and destiny. You have to recognize. I don't have to give in to the perverted spirit of the enemy. I can hear God's voice. I can follow God's voice. I can let him lead me. In the plan he has established before the foundation of the world in my life. Glory to God. The enemy will pervert godly passion into ungodly passion. You hear that? The enemy will pervert. He's a copycat. He will cause the calling on your life to become wicked with an ungodly passion to manipulate and control people for your own personal gain. You got a lot of pastors, a lot of apostles, a lot of teachers, a lot of missionaries, 
People are in ministry for themselves. It's not about the people. God said he gave some teachers, some prophets, some evangelists, all these different things in the body of Christ, right? The apostles for the building of the kingdom. But we find ourselves getting arrogant in these positions to satisfy our own itching ears. And we get stuck in the systematic of religion, in our mindsets, and follow the perverted, ungodly doctrine. You hear that? Ungodly doctrine. Because the ungodly doctrine contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it manipulates you and controls you to keep you in darkness. Let's go on a little further. Loss of zeal. Lost your zeal. I don't have nothing to drive or push me no more. I don't even care no more. What would be, que sera, sera, what would be, would be. I don't even care no more. I don't want to sing no more. I don't want to preach no more. I don't want to pray no more. I don't want to teach no more. I don't do nothing for God no more. I just have lost my zeal. I've been perverted by ungodly gospel, un ungodly doctrine by the enemy. I lost my desire to follow God. The key to overcome this is to ask God to be jealous over you. He will move in quickly to empower you to realize your covenant relationship. Do you understand that? We're in a covenant with God. We have a binding contract by the Spirit. So when you came to Jesus Christ, allow him to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior, you engage in a binding contract. And therefore, it cannot, it cannot be breached until you breach it. God's not going to breach the contract. You breach it by rebellion, by your stubbornness. And the enemy knows if I can cause you to lose your zeal, I can take away your passion, your ambition, your drive to follow God, and I can stop you from doing what God wants you to do. And that's to love him as the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. When you allow God and ask God to, to be jealous of you again, come back to your heart. God comes in and restores that relationship in the covenant. The thing that's been broken, God says, I bind it back together. That's how much he loves you. He loves me the same way. Feelings of not measuring up to the religious expectation, which results in performance. Oh my God. That caught my attention when I read that. I read this over and over and over, this one little point. Because a lot of people, because they have bad habits and sinful behaviors, been taught in the church, listen to me, that you never measure up to God's standards. You never change your life because of your sinful habit. So you get stuck in a performance of trying to pretend to look like you're born again, Look like you're serving Christ. You're still preaching. You're still teaching. You're still singing. Still doing different things in the church. Your ministry. You're helping people. All this stuff out of performance. But your heart's not yielded. I say on my men's prayer line every Sunday, we have to learn how to yield, surrender, and release ourselves into the will of God. Yield. Stop doing what you're doing. Allow the Holy Spirit to change your desire and your passion. Surrender. Lord, I realize I got some problems, some mistakes in my life. I can't seem to measure up. I keep making the same mistakes over and over. Therefore, I release my burdens to you, God. Because you said in your word, come to me all day, labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for my burden is light and my yoke is easy. So I come to you, God, Yielding, surrendering, releasing myself into your will 
say you will clean me up. Guess what he does? He changed the mindset. So it becomes no more performance. Now it comes a life surrendered. So now what I do, I do to the glory of God. Not for man's approval. Because performance, I'm doing things for man's approval. But when I yield to God, surrender to God, release to God, even my concern, my complaints, what's on my mind, God says, now I can handle it. I can put you on straight street and cause your life to be reconditioned and changed by the Spirit of God. I don't want the same old life. I want a new life. The words of death of any man being Christ Jesus, a new creature. Old things are past, we hold all things become new. I want the newness that's found in him. God bless you, our prophet Abel. Let's go a little further. Unclean thoughts. Hear that? Unclean thoughts. Are your, is your thought life healthy? Or is your thought life unclean? Are you constantly conjuring in your mind that either get even with people because they hurt you? Even on your job, they pass you for promotion? They even might have laid you off. Are you in your mindset trying to get to the place when you're trying to get even? That's an unhealthy thought life. And God is saying tonight, don't allow yourself to be manipulated by the enemy. Don't be controlled with unclean thoughts. Control and manipulation. We have to realize these are the tools the enemy uses against us to stop us in our tracks. Hopelessness and discouragement, depression, sickness and disease, infirmities, sexual molestation, and any form of seduction, complicated religious lifestyle. All these things are the attributes of the enemy, his characteristics. We talk about in our church all the time. We tell our leaders, you have to maintain your character in the, in the form of Christ. Don't allow your character to be tainted by any of these mind-binding, controlling spirits of the enemy. Because he knows if I can control and manipulate you, I can put you in a state of hopelessness and discouragement. I can afflict you with depression, sickness, and diseases. Remind you of your past, how you've been hurt through molestation, how you've been abused, how you've been put out, how you've been homeless. We all have gone through something in our life that we're not pleased with. And the enemy wants to play a broken record in your mind to repeat the cycle over and over and over and over in your mindset, to keep reminding yourself of the person who hurt you, keep reminding you of how you've been mistreated, how you've been left alone, how you've been put in foster care, how, how your mother left you in the street, all this stuff. Whatever your situation is that happened to you as a child, he wants you to nurse, curse, and rehearse it. Broken cycle. Keep going over and over and over in your mind. That familiar spirit that keeps on coming through ancestry. Well, my grandmother was a molester. My grandfather was a molester. My uncle was a molester. Their father was a molester. So generations in our family is nothing but molesters. So the same spirit on me to molest somebody else. Or I've been molested, therefore I molest somebody else because I've been molested. We all have gone through something in our lives and we would have never made it if God didn't let you, didn't, 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 had let you lose your mind. If God had let you lose your mind, you would have never made it. But God says the worst things in your life are called to work out for the good. Because I know you before you're in your mother's womb, the life you're going to go through, the journey you're going to go through, therefore I also knew the outcome. He said things that we see, we see through a glass darkly. 
But when Christ appears, then we shall see clearly who he is as we are in this world. But we got to be willing to be, be open and confess with our mouth, yes, I've been hurt. Yes, I've been molested. Yes, this happened to me. Yes, people treat me this way. But this is not the end of my life. Complicated religion make you think that you got to stay in that place in your mind. But God says, nope, I broke it. I broke the cycle. I cut off the bloodline. I purged the generation of bloodline through the blood of Jesus Christ that the same spirit that was transferred from generation before you to this present day will no longer impact your children. You have to believe that for yourself. It doesn't matter what you go through. You have the power to overcome but you got to want to overcome. Greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. The greater one can do nothing for you if you don't yield, surrender, and release yourself into his will. Let's go a little further. We're going to get ready to close in a few minutes. The enemy constantly attempts to seduce us into believing that receiving from God is hard or difficult. You hear that? He wants to constantly remind you to manipulate and control your mindset. To think that from receiving from God is a hard thing. He always trying to remember the past, the failures, the mistakes. So he keeps putting it in your mindset over and over and over. So you won't go further into the future God has for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, God said, I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, not even do you know and do you good. You can expect the end. So God knows the plan he has for you to prosper you, do you no harm, and give you an expected end. But the enemy said, nope, it's hard. I, I can't live, live the life God wants me to live because of, of, of how they treated me, how my mama treated me, how my daddy was treating me. How my dad was abusive. So my mom didn't care about me. How, how he did this to me when I was a child. But God says, I paid the price for that area too. Through the blood of Jesus. But you got to be willing to let the blood cleanse you. Always try to remember that it's not hard to receive from God. Simply use childlike faith to receive. What did Jesus tell his disciples? He came to a fig tree. And he came there when he was hungry, looking to expect to get some figs off the tree. And he found there was none, and it was a season for bearing. So he cursed the tree. And the disciples were amazed and profound what he had just done. And Jesus turned to them and says, have faith in God. He told them on occasion, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountains and it will move. So the very thing I've done to this fig tree, you can do the same thing. So you got to have childlike faith because the child faith is unwavering. It's unshaky. When a child believes something that you tell them, they trust you. You let them down, you might hurt them, but they still come back and trust you. Because they got faith in you. God said, so you got that kind of faith like a child to trust him. Even when you hurt, when you're disappointed, when you're discouraged, do you still trust me? Breakthrough is not due to our efforts. Breakthrough. Your breakthrough just around the corner. But you miss it because you get blinded by the enemy of looking at your mistakes and failures and the things that go on in your life, the circumstance, the issues at hand. Breakthrough is not due to our efforts. It is due to our obedience and his grace. You hear that? Our breakthrough to come out of poverty, lack, a mentality of the flesh, that keeps you bound and in darkness and bondage and prison 
is predicated on your obedience. When you say, God, I trust you, the words that trust the Lord with all your heart, lead not your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path, it's predicated on your obedience. So if you tell God, I trust you, I believe in your word, God said, that's what I'm looking for. A heart surrender, a heart that's yielded. Then I can bring breakthrough in your life because of his grace. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I cannot dwell in God's house forever with his goodness and his grace unless I walk in obedience. If I walk in obedience, then I have the power. Look, look at this one. Patterns of lustful behavior, perversion. I have the power to overcome the patterns of lustful behavior. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I can overcome it. Because the spirit of perversion is broken off my life through the power of Jesus Christ and the blood that cleanses me from all sin. So now I encourage you to pray for the pray this following prayer. So I want you all to do this, do this with me tonight. Now I encourage you to pray the following prayer, lifting up the Father, lifting up to the Father, all check in areas above. So whatever those areas in that list that you checked off, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Father, I come to you pleading the precious blood of Jesus, thanking you for the blood of Christ, which is my hedge of divine protection. Lord, you're going to lock down my enemies and destroy the territorial demons that attempts to steal our land. I ask you to station your host of angels around me and my family. I take authority over death, destruction, and despair. I bind every evil influence. Jezebel, Athaliah, and Delilah, the occult spirit, all demonic assignments planned by the devil. I take authority over all spirits of divination and the occult strongholds that attempt to steal my life and destiny. I thank you for the wind of your spirit that releases the prayers of the saints and bring life to my potential and my future. Thank you, Lord, that I am breaking out of all sides and experiencing divine enlargement. I, like Jael, drive a tent peg into the enemy's plan. I realize that the enemy has attacked me with this list of different ways. Satan has attacked you, your family, business, ministry, etc. Use the list you checked above and name them one by one. I am fully aware that you have given me all the power and authority over the enemy. I believe this is my season to dethrone Satan from every area of my life. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you pray that prayer in agreement tonight, you just got your breakthrough from the demonic control of Jezebel, Athelie, and Delilah. And the power of God has been released to flow through you to empower you to walk in your destiny and your purpose. In the name of Jesus. You have to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to transform your thinking. 
to become more and more what God has called you to be and to stand fast in the word of God that God will use you mightily in his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So next week we're going to pick up in chapter 2 talking about Jezebel's evil. Amen. So I pray that bless you tonight. Encourages you to stand on the word. Study your word. If you don't have this book, get this book. You got to get this book. You got to get this book. It's a very powerful book to have in your library. I can't say it if anymore, but you got to get this book. This book is very powerful. The enemy knows what he wants to do in your life to stop you from moving in your purpose and plan God has for you. You got to get this book and allow the, the Lord to transform your life. Because I tell you, when you begin to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, things change. It changes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I tell you, when God begins to speak by his spirit, ain't nothing you can do to stop God from moving in your life. Amen. I'm going to put this book up here right quick in just a second because I tell you, this is something we need to get. Amen. So here's the name of the book. If you don't have this book, you need to get this book. If you need me to get a book for you, contact me through my inbox or call me at 414-299-6463. 414-299-6463. And let me know if you're interested in getting a book. And I'll order a book for you. But I need to have at least more than two people to get a book so I can order the book, several books at one time. Amen. Because the books are $16. $15. So, glory to God in the highest. Anyone got any questions or comments tonight? I thank everybody for coming on tonight. I tell you, it's really been a good lesson. And if um, anyone have any questions or comments, you can call me at the same number later on tonight. You can call right now. If you got a question you want, to, uh, want me to answer, you can call and I'll answer that question for you. 414-299-6463. Amen. If not, we're going to go ahead and close out tonight. My prayer has been a blessing to you. Send up those Facebook stars. Those stars are, are used to help the ministry. And every star I get on Facebook, I turn around and put it right back into the church for our project. We have a project of expanding our building. So we're doing a fundraiser trying to get that going for uh, hopefully by next year to get it started. So keep plant, praying for Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church. I'm the leadership of Pastor Cornell and Barbara Anderson. Keep praying for, for our ministry that God will uh, fulfill the dream and the plan that's given our leader to fulfill it. Because I know God can do it. We've done many supernatural things in this ministry since I've been, I've been in ministry going on seven years. And I tell you, in that seven years, God has done some great things. And I tell you, if you really want to see God move your life, sow a seed. Sow a seed. Your seed opens the door for God to bless you even more. People don't realize that. It's not about the money. It's about the obedience. It's about the obedience. And that's what God looks for. A heart that's yielded, surrendered, and released. To be obedient. If God says so, it seems to me you can cash up. All the info is on this link for the class tonight. If you, if you want to cash up me something for the ministry, you can do that too. But don't allow yourself to talk yourself out of being obedient to the Spirit of God to be a blessing to the ministry. When you obey God, it doesn't matter the amount. I say this all the time. God is not about the money, about the obedience. It's not about how much you sow. It's about the faith you give when you sow. What are you expecting God to do for you when you sow a seed into the ministry? I've done it many, many, many times. Sown in people's lives. And, and, and I've seen God bless me even more with what I needed. I don't ask people for anything. I never do. But I always pray about what I need. And I keep doing what God told me to do, be obedient. And in the process, God in return blesses me even more. So I encourage you with that word as we get ready to close tonight, as we do each week. If you're on here tonight, don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. The word says, 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive our sins and cleanse from all unrighteousness. That if, that if thou shalt confess thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. You can be born again just by praying this one this simple prayer tonight. So I want you to repeat after me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowing. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I thank you, and I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been a backslider and you prayed that prayer tonight, you just got restored. If you were a sinner that know Jesus, the Lord and Savior, for whosoever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you just got born again tonight. And the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that gave his life over to the Lord. So if nothing else, I pray you all be blessed tonight. You stay encouraged, study your word, and know that God has a blessing for you with your name on it. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, shalom. Peace be unto you. Amen. You all have a blessed night. Stay excited about Jesus. Don't lose your zeal. Don't lose your passion. Don't lose your fire. But let God become that consuming fire in your heart to consume all the dross of sin in your life and to empower you to live a free life in Christ Jesus. Have a good night.